Hello everyone, welcome to another Boomer Tech video. Thanks for tuning in. Now, if you're of a certain age, a bit like me, you've grown up with PCs and um, maybe you remember right back from the very, very first ones that came out in the 1980s, uh, like I do. And um, well, fun fact, actually, I was born on the same day the very first uh, 8086 processor was released. And uh, since then, it's been a bit of a love-hate relationship with PCs. And um, it's mostly love, actually. And uh, But going back to the 1980s, specifically, um, when I was using PCs then, it was um, primarily with using five and a quarter inch discs like this. Now, five and a quarter inch discs came out in 1976, so they predate PCs. These are based on an earlier format um, from the late 1960s called the eight inch floppy. But as far as PCs are concerned, this is uh, the only disc that's actually floppy, out of the floppy disk family. Um, but this is what we had in the 1980s. They don't store an awful lot. Uh, it depends which format you get. This particular one is 360K. Uh, they did come as big as 1.2 megabytes. It's a bit out of the scope of the video to talk too much about the, the format. Um, but I, I use these a lot in school and uh, friends' computers. I didn't actually have a PC of my own until a bit later on. Uh, but for transferring files around, uh, programs, um, any kind of media, this is what you used. And they worked, you know, fine, really, provided you looked after them and kept them in their uh, their wallets. And I still have most of my five and a quarter inch discs from when I was a, a youngster. So I'm pleased to, to still have access to them. Um, but by the time you get to the late 1980s, things changed a bit. Um, certainly into the 1990s, using three and a half inch discs like this, which stored a little bit more. And in theory, they were a better uh, item because obviously they weren't floppy, but the disc inside is floppy. But that's neither here nor there. But the idea was it didn't need a paper sleeve because it had this metal sleeve on it instead. Um, they're supposed to be a bit easier to carry and put it in your pocket. It's harder to bend. Um, and the right protect notch was a little switch rather than having to put a bit of tape over the, the cutout there. So in theory, these were a superior product. I'm not entirely convinced that they were. Personally, I, I don't know if that, you'd agree with me, but um, I use these a lot, like I used these a lot before. And actually, I tend to have more problems with these than I ever did with these. Maybe that was just me. Um, but until about the mid-90s, that was what we used for sharing files around. By the time you get to the mid 90s, I was using these zip disks. You know, like a lot of people, these were really um, quite popular. They came in various sizes. This is a 100 megabyte version. They also did a, uh, a 250 version. And right at the end of the product life, they did a 750 version, um, but I never had one of those. And I actually don't know anyone who ever did have one. I think they were um, a bit of a flop really, but. The early ones, the 100s and the 250s, I, uh, I use them extensively. So this is about the mid 90s. Um, they sort of a lot more than one of these. They had a reputation for being a bit unreliable. I never experienced that. Um, generally, they were pretty good to me. Um, I have no real complaints about them. They're quite a sturdy package there. And again, they had like um, a mechanical, uh, flap over the, the disc access um, and they came in these quite cool little boxes they weren't particularly cheap but they were they were good you know I'm perfectly uh, happy with those um, by the time you get to the late 90s myself like a lot of other people had kind of moved on to optical discs um, be it a CDR like this one a writable CD and then the the DVD equivalent um, after that, because these were so cheap, I mean, you know, this holds 700 meg. So compared to a 100 meg zip disc, you know, obviously seven times, and these were like pennies each. You know, they, these were never that cheap. You can see why they're not, because they're, they're quite well made. There's a bit of effort gone into manufacturing them, whereas these are much more um, easy to mass produce. So for, for archival stuff, yeah, we use that a lot right into the 2000s. Um, and I think I kind of stopped storing all my data and programs on these probably about 2010, I would say, maybe a little bit later. Um, because after then, we kind of all moved on to uh, 
like USB sticks and stuff or USB portable hard disks like a lot of people did these are super convenient of course um, pretty much every machine has got a USB socket of some flavor USB has been around a long time and it's backwards compatible so you know you don't need like the latest USB um, to access older drives etc um, so I've got a lot of data on, on these sorts of things as well and one other format I would like to mention because um, it's uh, it's relevant is SCSI now this is really more of a 1990s thing but throughout the 1990s uh, I did quite a lot with SCSI drives. Anything that required quite a bit of storage, I had external SCSI drives, and I've still got them too. And I'm not I'm not holding an actual SCSI drive here because they're they're, they're great big things. Um, but just to signify it, I've uh, got a SCSI Terminator there, so that's a SCSI port. So I have quite a lot of media on that too. So what I wanted to do was build a computer system that would access all of these different types of media um, and be able to access you know, everything from the five and a quarter all the way up to USB, but beyond that, because these days I don't even really use USB. You know, the final piece of the puzzle really these days tend to store a lot of stuff on the cloud. I'm talking about things like uh, OneDrive, uh, Google Drive, um, Live Drive, you know, Dropbox, and I send files around to uh, friends using like uh, WhatsApp. Um, so these days, it's all kind of cloud online storage. You know, don't even tend to really use stuff like this much. Um, so I wanted a machine that could also do that, something that could run WhatsApp, um, the latest Windows operating system, the latest browser from uh, Google. So I can access all the Google apps and stuff like that, but still be able to go right back to reading disks um, like the five and a quarter and three and a half, all of these. Um, it's quite important to me. And when I mean disk access, especially talking now about the five and a quarter, I don't mean something like a grease weasel, which is a, uh, a USB adapter that lets you read um, very old disk formats at a, a very very low level like literally at the zeros and ones and like the flux level so you can um, by using python scripts you can uh, wire up one of these uh, grease weasel adapters i do have one it's very good um, but it uh, it works at a very very low level and um, it lets you manipulate image files like binary images um, which is great, and it's certainly great if you want to access disk formats from other uh, types of machine, like you know the Apple II, for instance, or the Acorn BBC, or whatever it is. Um, but for PC specifically, I wanted to be able to put the disk in the drive in Windows, and up comes an actual folder full of all the files, just like any other disk. And I wanted it to be much more uh, natively supported like that. So that was a bit of a challenge. So uh, let's see what I came up with. Ta-da, here it is. And uh, I know this is a really retro looking machine, um, but it doesn't have to be like this. I'll just turn it on a minute. Uh, you could use a much newer, um, sort of you know, black and gray or rainbow fan case if you wanted in a flat panel display. Um, but I like retro looking stuff, so I've gone for that kind of styly on this one. Okay, so it's counting the RAM. Uh, this machine's got eight gig. Uh, just take a, couple of minutes just to uh, a couple of seconds to count that right it's going through its uh its contents there. there's a scuzzy card let's get ready to boot and here it comes uh, so this is windows 11 just regular windows 11 uh, at the time of recording this is the latest microsoft operating system and what we're now going to do is go through some of these discs and uh see it working Let's start with the zip disk. Here we are, into the drive, and Windows should actually just open a uh, folder on its own, showing the contents. And there it is. That's the contents of that disk. It's just a bunch of files, there's nothing particularly interesting. But it works. So all the files, you can copy and delete as you want. Uh, that's the actual drive. It doesn't actually come with a nice zip drive icon. 
um, but you can actually change the icons for ones you download if you want, but I haven't bothered in this case. So there's the properties, uh, we can eject it directly um, from there, just like a CD-ROM actually. There we go. So that all works. That's a 250 drive, so you can use 100 or 250 meg uh, disks. Right, so three and a half inch now, put that in. You do need to click on the actual three and a half inch drive icon. And there we go, it's just a couple of files in there. Let's open one up. And there we go. It's actually a copy of Wolfenstein 3D, I think. And that's just the file ID file for it. Um, now let's have a look at the five and a quarter next. I'm amazed Windows 11 actually has a an icon for it. It actually supports five and a quarter inch drive natively. Uh, so let's open that up. There's a bunch of files. This is actually a boot disk. I'll tell you what would be interesting is to do like a disk to disk copy. Um, perhaps we can cut and paste all the files. Uh, from this disk over to the other disk. Just a floppy drive, uh, sorry, the three and a half inch. Uh, where's paste? Ah, there it is, okay. Off they go. This brings back memories. It's not very fast. <laughs> but that's fine. What matters is it works. Yeah, there we go. As it happens on this system, uh, the five and a quarter inch is drive A, and the three and a half is drive B. You can have whatever way around you want, I guess. Something I did want to show you, um, which I thought was quite clever. Um, with the five and a quarter, this is a 1.2 meg disc. And on it is a like an MP3 music file. Actually, it's an OGG file. Um, it's like, it's a really high quality, uh, nearly CD quality. But it, it'll play it without stuttering. You know, this is a 1976 disc format, so I'm just going to play it, and you can hear it. There's no buffering required. You know, even at like full CD quality, it plays it fine. Nice catchy little tune, actually. Now I'll stop it there. There we go. You don't need to make you listen to all of that. Uh, you only really get about, I don't know, three minutes of sound on that. And that disc at that quality, so yeah. like I say, it's 1976 technology. This, uh, and I think just to show you that it will actually boot from the floppy, let's do it. Um, yeah, this machine will will boot from a five and a quarter inch disc. So if we just restart the machine, hopefully, what we'll see is DOS 6.2 appear. Um, that three and a half inch disc is not a boot disc, so we'll take it out. In case it tries to boot from that instead. Okay, machine coming back up. There we go. Start MS DOS. Yay. It is 6.2. So it takes it a minute, loading all for five and a quarter. There we go. There's the prompt, D-I-R, enter. Yay. 
and Miss Dawson. Okay, while we're here, I did want to show you actually, this machine does have some utility. It's, it's not just a, something to move files around. Uh, it is, it's an old machine, it's an old processor. But you know what, it, it, it works good. I mean, I, I need that, because I need to be able to move files to and from cloud-based services and all the rest of it. Um, so it's got to be able to run the latest stuff. Uh, so this is um, the latest version of uh, Google Chrome, uh, obviously connected to YouTube. Uh, if I just go and have a look at this uh, really good channel here, um, this is literally the best channel on YouTube. Look at this advert. You know, channel's not even monetized. It might be one day, but it's not at the moment. So they just showed out of it anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, you've got this really handsome dude here. Um, but the point is that it's, uh, you know, plays back even full screen video. Um, absolutely fine um, you know it, it works well it's not really a games computer I don't think you want to do much gaming on it um, but you know it, it, it has basic graphics ability you know even though it's a really old processor in here and there's no GPU it's all just on board stuff um, it actually you know it, it can still do it you know I think Something like Roblox would probably be about the limit, really. I don't think you'd want to be playing uh, Fortnite on it. I don't think you want to play Fortnite on anything. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, yeah, works all right. Now, I do want to show you it working with a SCSI drive. Because uh, I did say it has SCSI capability, and it does. So let's fire it up. This particular external SCSI drive, it's old, it's 1989. Um, you can see the big black faceplate that was fashionable at the time. Uh, sadly, the little LED on it doesn't work anymore. Um, so you can't see it flashing away, um, but it does work. So this is a 1989 drive. It's about half a gigabyte, I think. No, it's more than that, I think it's about 650 meg but windows 11's perfectly happy to use it it'll come up no problem here we go scuzzy 650 that's all that's on this drive let's just copy these files off and dump them on the desktop just to show you it copying and there we go so this drive despite being I mean, they're really old now. You know, 1989 is old for a hard disk. Um, it's it works fine. You know, just as a regular drive in in Windows 11. So you know, I can drag and drop files off it onto OneDrive or whatever. Um, it's not very fast, but you know, this is 1989. So you know, for 1989, that's perfectly fast. Um, or whatever that is, and sort of. Somewhere between half a megasecond and one megasecond. You know. It works. You know, I don't think you'd be streaming 8K video at 144 frames a second on it. But, you know, it works. So there we go. What I'm going to do now is talk just a little bit about how this machine was put together, what parts are in it. Um, if you're not interested in that side of it, you can stop the video now. Uh, but if you are, I'm going to give you a quick tour of the inside. Okay, let's talk about how the system was put together. But before we do, a word from our sponsor. No, I'm only joking. I don't have a sponsor. So without further delay, this is the heart of the thing. This is the motherboard, obviously. Um, now, I haven't just taken it out of the case. Uh, the person who was selling the motherboard on the internet, on eBay it was actually, um, was selling the motherboard for pretty much the cost of postage. And they had three for sale, so I, I bought all three because that's just what I do. I'm thinking perhaps it'd be the, the holy grail of motherboards, so uh, you know, I may as well get a few. So this is another one of them, but it's exactly the same one. 
Now, to make this uh, system work in the way that uh, I intended, um, I wanted something that was old enough that it would actually have floppy drive support natively on the motherboard. Uh, that was important because I didn't want to get into trying to hack together some kind of um, USB interface to the five and a quarter inch drive. I wanted the drive to be supported natively on the motherboard in the BIOS. So you want a motherboard that can support a drive made in 1976, um, which is a bit of a tall order these days. And I can tell you now there is no new motherboard that will do that, <laughs> you know, but I wanted it new enough that it would run Windows 11, you know, so it's a case of something old enough that will support the drives, but new enough that the latest operating system will run on it. Um, I was hoping there'd be some kind of overlap and I was trying to find a motherboard that really fitted in that little sort of niche gap. And I did some research and this is the one I came up with. And I don't doubt for a moment that there are other ones that will meet this uh, requirement also. This is the first one I found that was definitely right. So it was the one I searched for on eBay. Um, a bunch of them came up. It wasn't hard to get. There was like loads of different sellers selling these. Um, like I say, I picked up three from like the, um, the one I could find on the first page that was cheapest. Buy it now. So they're not like rare or anything. Um, I will put the actual part names and numbers and stuff in the description. Um, but just for the sake of completeness, this is a Foxconn G41MXP. And I like this board because it will take a range of processors. Um, in this particular one, it's come with a Pentium dual core E7600 at 3.2 gigahertz. So it's a, it's a dual core. Uh, processor it's pretty old you know but this board will actually do quite a bit newer than that if you want it to it's a socket 775 so you know, it's one of these chips um, there are according to the manual there are i5s and i3s and stuff uh, that this board will work with so you can get something a lot newer uh, i couldn't tell you what generation and stuff you know you'd have to go and google that yourself if you wanted to know but these particular ones came with that dual core Pentium um, and it works fine with those. So I've not really felt the need to get something bigger. And also the other reason is that um, embarrassingly, the case that I was using has a power supply built into it, um, which is from the 1990s. It's ATX, but it only has a 20 pin power connector because back then these were 20 pin. This is now 24 and the 24 today even. So the last four on the end, um, the power supply from the case that I've got basically leaves those last four empty. So it's not providing a full power supply to it. And that's okay within certain um, ranges, basically not providing the board with as much power as it needs for some processor and um, expansion card combinations. Um, you can do it if you're not using too powerful a processor. Um, you have to be a bit careful because quite often the board won't know that you've not put a 24 pin um, cable in and it can run a bit hot. You know, if you run a high power processor um, and you've only got a 20 pin uh, input, you can find this socket can get really hot because it's trying to pull too many amps through it and it can really do. Um, so you do have to be cautious with that. Uh, for me though, this, this Pentium dual core, um, it's actually quite a low power processor. It runs fine. I've run it for hours and this doesn't even get warm. Um, so in my case, I've got no particular issue. I would imagine if I ended up putting like a, you know, I don't know, a quad core or a six core i5 in or something, maybe it would um, need a lot more power than, than that could provide with only 20. Um, 20 pins there. I did find this board very um, picky on memory. It was very fussy. Uh, now that might just be me being unlucky. It came with four gig of RAM, but I wanted eight gig. Uh, there's only two um, DDR3 sockets. 
so I, I've got a big pile of random DDR, you know, all different types. I tried loads of different types and I really struggled to find anything that worked. But I did in the end. Um, these 4 gig uh, 10600E um, Hynix uh, Sims, uh, sorry, let's use the old tech there. Um, these um, DDR3 uh, modules actually work fine. They run at 133 megahertz, which is about as fast as you're going to get out of this. Um, and you specify the memory speed uh, with, a, with a jumper there. You can put it onto 133 or, or default. And I run mine at 133, it's absolutely fine. And the important points here are that firstly it has a floppy drive interface. That is a real 34 pin floppy drive connector. And to be honest, a lot of newer boards I found, I say newer, I mean the sort of age of, of this board, a lot of them did have this connector, but I found that it would only work with a three and a half inch drive. They'd removed the bias um, functionality for the older five and a quarter inch drives. I don't know why, I don't really see why they needed to do that. Um, but a lot of the newer boards that still have this connector are three and a half inch drive only, which was no good for me, obviously, because I want to use a five and a quarter inch drive. This does support a five and a quarter inch drive. I found that up in the, in the manual. Um, both 360 drive and the 1.2 meg. Um, so either or is fine. It's supported natively, so that's wonderful. The disadvantage was that I didn't find out until after I bought the board is that you can only have one drive on there. Uh, what type of drive it is, is your business, but you can only have one. So for me, I wanted the five and a quarter and the three and a half. Uh, so the five and a quarter goes to this. The three and a half actually is not so much of a big deal because there are cheap and plentiful adapters on eBay that will convert a three and a half inch drive to a USB and power it from USB. No such thing exists that I've ever found for five and a quarter. Um, so you've got these USB headers here. What I do is just bring a USB cable, as I'll show you in a minute, I'll open the case, but a USB cable down to the header there. So it's all internal. Actually, the bias recognizes it as an onboard floppy but it recognizes it as a USB mounted onboard floppy drive. So it works, you know. Um, it even does a floppy seek at, at, at boot. Um, but for the five and a quarter onto there, so that works fine. You know, normally, as, as you probably know, you can have two drives from one interface, but for some reason the BIOS on this does not support that. I don't know if there's a different BIOS available, that maybe it does, but anyway, it doesn't on, on mine. Um, so you've also got, uh, importantly, you've got four SATA interfaces there. I'm not sure what flavour of SATA they are. Uh, this particular machine, or this board should say, dates from 2011, which should give you an idea. Um, but I just use one of these to run the, uh, the hard disk that I use inside the machine, which is a SSD, normal SATA SSD. I think it's 250 meg or something. Also important here is a legacy IDE or ATA socket. So that is a normal 40 pin IDE socket. That goes to the zip drive on mine. And it also goes to the DVD-ROM drive. I know I didn't show you that working because you, know, you don't need to see a DVD-ROM drive working, but it does. Um, of course, I could have used a SATA DVD-ROM drive or DVD-write or whatever that could have gone to one of these, but the one I put in the system, uh, it's a parallel ATA one. So this goes to the zip drive and the uh, and the CD-ROM drive. So that's all fine. This particular board does support a TPM module, but I'm not bothered with that. Um, now, if we can just have a quick look at the the back, uh, you can see it supports onboard video. You've got analog VJ there, which I'm using because I'm using a CRT, but it's also got digital out there. So you, um, if you want to use a flat panel, you can convert that very easily into DisplayPort or HDMI. 
uh, or just use DVID like that if you want. Uh, it's got onboard networking, which is good. I think it's just 100 megabit, but you know, it's fine. Onboard sound, of course. It does have onboard USB. Um, so that gives you your access to your USB sticks or your pocket hard disks or whatever. Um, you can use PS2 style mouse and keyboard or even a serial mouse if you want uh, on this. Um, in fact, I, I do with mine. But yeah, you got USB there. It's USB 2, so it's not really that fast. But I'm not really bothered about that. As long as I can get files off USB hard disks and stuff and memory sticks, um, that's fine. And as you can see also, um, there's both types of PCI slots. There's the legacy ones here, 32-bit legacy PCI slots, and also more modern PCI Express um, sockets, including a full-length 16-lane one there. Um, in my system, as you'll see, I don't have any kind of card in the PCI Express. Um, I think it would put a bit more strain on the power socket if I did anyway. I'm just using the onboard, um, or the, the on-chip GPU, which is old and basic. It's an Intel um, GPU, but it works, not just come straight through the, uh, you know, the output there. So I think if I had a... Um, you know the proper power supply i don't see why you couldn't use like a, any any modern graphics card in there really i think you'd be wasting your time with a 4090 or something i think it would be quite throttled by the cpu but you could put something bigger in if you wanted to and that's the main thing and you got a single lane one there um which is, could be could be useful um if you think of like usb3 cards are usually single lane so you could put a you know a a USB 3 adapter in there or 3.1 or 3.2 so you can have access to more USB sockets and faster ones if you want I'm not bothering um, I don't really feel the need to um, but the legacy PCI that's kind of important to me because of uh, the SCSI card yeah you can get SCSI cards in PCI Express but I happen to have a load that's native PCI um, so you know, I did want at least one um, native uh, PCI socket there um, so I can use my old SCSI card. So, as I say, really, this board is ideal. So with 8 gig of RAM and a half decent processor, even though it's old, it runs Windows 11 fine. Um, so in a minute, uh, we're going to open the machine up to have a quick look inside. But before we do, I just wanted to say um, Windows 11 specifically is very weird when you try and install it it uh, it will actually run perfectly fine on an older system like this um, you saw on the video earlier you know it, it's fine it's just like a slow machine but it'll run office it'll run um, all the google apps it'll run youtube it'll run you know, basic games this isn't really a games machine it'd probably be a bit better with a better graphics card but um, basically, it's fine. It's got 8 gig of RAM. It's got 64-bit um, instruction sets, multi-core. Um, you could put a bigger processor in it with even more cores if you wanted. But Windows 11 refuses to install on a system like this. It says it's too old. And it's quite infuriating. I'm not really quite sure why they decided to do that. Maybe they're sick of tech support calls from people with old computers saying, you know, it's running slower than I wanted it to. What's going on? I don't know what their thing is, but maybe they've got some kind of deal with uh, Intel to try and force people to buy newer machines. But I think it's a bit of a shame because um, maybe in the Western world, perhaps, you'd see a lot more newer machines and it's less of an issue. But you know, people with less money or people in developing countries... Probably not buying new machines as often and probably not going to be wanting to always have the latest and greatest PC. It's a shame to deny them access to the latest operating system more out of a policy decision on anything technical. Um, so this board and memory and chip actually runs Windows 11 absolutely fine, but it won't let you install it by default. It will tell you it's too old, it doesn't have the right features. But that's just garbage, it does. Um, so what you're going to have to do is install Windows 11 with some special settings that 
stops it from looking at um, your system requirements. Um, you can force it to do that. It's outside of the scope of this video, um, but it's there if you want it. You know, go and have a look on, on YouTube. Uh, it's actually quite easy. It's quite easy to do. Um, and then it'll work fine on the system. Okay, let's pop the lid off and have a quick look. So a quick look inside the case. There's the power supply the um, the old case comes with. This is, uh, I don't know, I think it's late 90s. Um, or very early 2000s at the latest. There's a 300 watt power supply. And the fan in it's not very good. So because of that, I put two fairly decent sized fans there that actually bring air in over the processor. And I've got like a slot fan here, which takes air out. So you've got a really good circulation going on there. Not this processor gets very hot, but even so. Um, so it's the same board you saw before. It's just the one I've put in this system. Um, what well, can I show you? Well, I'll start with a SCSI card. Let's pull it out because I haven't screwed it in right. Okay, so this is an adapt deck, AHA 2940 wide, and it was made in 1996. So it's quite an old SCSI card. Uh, it's got like the uh, 68 pin SCSI um, high density socket at the back. It also has an internal one if you're running internal hard disks. And it's got the good old fashioned 50 pin um, narrow SCSI there and it's a wider socket, but it's that's that's the original old fashioned SCSI socket. Uh, so this card, as I say, is from 1996. Um, it's legacy PCI. Windows 10 does not support this natively. There are more modern cards that run on PCI Express that Windows 10 does have drivers for, but Windows 10, sorry, Windows 11, that it supplies to Windows 10 as well, does not have legacy drivers for these built in. And Adapt Deck have not written drivers for their uh, 1996 cards for Windows 11. However, there is a, a very kind person on the internet who has written a driver for this that works absolutely fine in Windows 10 and 11. And if you Google that, because it's outside the scope of this video, you'll, you'll find it. So if you've got the same card as this, yes, it will work absolutely fine with Windows 10 and Windows 11. You just need to download the third party driver. Um, the only slight sort of um, complication with it, and it's a very minor complication, is that uh, the person who's programmed the drivers for this it's not a signed driver if you want to write a driver for some hardware and get it signed that means all approved by Microsoft um, it costs a lot of money to do that and the, this person's done it out of the good of their heart so it's not a signed driver and what that means is you have to boot Windows in uh, a special mode that disables um, signed driver um, requirement to install new drivers only once I need to install the driver um, so you have to boot it in safe mode there's instructions on the internet you put it in safe mode and you basically disabled the requirement for signed drivers it's like a virus protection thing and then you can install the SCSI drivers then you can reboot windows um, just normally then you don't need to boot into safe mode every time you just boot normally uh, and then this drive um, so this card will work fine, and it has worked fine ever since. So it's fine. It's it's a good way to do it. So I put that back in, and then what else can I show you? Yeah, well, there's the floppy drive cable. Obviously, the ribbon cables on these. Um, there's your five and a quarter inch uh, floppy connector. Uh, that's for three and a half. It's drive A, the other side of the twist. See, there's two sets because five and a quarter and three and a half inch drives have different connectors, even though they're logically compatible. Uh, three and a half are well, the, the pins there. Five and a quarter is an edge connector. And the ones on the end, the other side of the twist of drive A. So hence why it's that way around. As I said before, this is a 1.2 meg drive. Um, a 360K drive is, would just be the same. Um, this uh, cable here, that's the parallel ATA um, cable, which goes to the zip, line, zip drive, sorry, and then branches out to the CD-ROM. Actually, it's a DVD-ROM. 
Um, I've extended it to make it a bit easier. See, there's like an extension piece because otherwise it was just too tight. It was uh, didn't look very good. Right, the floppy drive, as I said before, um, it's not. Um, it, would, it could be connected into there, but the BIOS only supports one drive, so this is done through USB. So these things are readily available, made of Chinesium. Um, they're a couple of pounds, you know, a couple of dollars from China. And so you've got a floppy drive, only three and a half inch. Um, it's the only ones they'll support um, socket there. And on the other end is a uh, just USB that goes onto a header that I put on the motherboard there. And that is literally it and it works. Um, as I say, there is no equivalent for five and a quarter inch drives. So that works fine in this case. If you're wondering what that is, that's not external power that it needs. That's so you can power the drive from the USB if you want. Um, I see no point in doing that in this system because the power supply has a, um, a cable for the three and a half inch drive anyway. And I don't want any more power taken off the motherboard than I need um, because of the, the power cable situation. Because um, I'm naughty, I haven't screwed this down. Um, but that is the, uh, the um, solid state drive running happily in there. Um, which boots windows and, and so forth. So that's kind of it really. You know, everything else is fairly self-explanatory. Um, there's your drives at the front. You know, everything else is all pretty standard. So, so there we go, that's it, that's the system. So thank you very much for watching and uh, Sorry, it's been a longer video this time. i um, tried to go into a bit more detail than I normally do. Always keen to hear your feedback on that kind of thing. Um, yeah, please uh, like and subscribe and leave me a comment. And hopefully we'll see you in another video soon. Okay, take care.